won't be moving around. Hello, everyone. We are back. If you uh, joined us previously, we were having issues getting <laughs> Dr. Wine is situated. Hopefully, we don't have any more issues because the conversation we know is extremely important. Everybody was uh, looking forward to talking about it. We're just going to start over. I'm going to delete the original uh, content that was uh, created because of the technical difficulties that we have. Um, I'm super excited about this show. I, I think it's going to empower many of us uh, to really uh, continue to live our lives well, regardless of sometimes things that blindside us. Dr. Wyden has a, a powerful story of that happening. Sometimes uh, we in situations and Things just pop off, as they say. <laughs> right. No, no surprise of our own. Um, and we have to make start making a decision to live or wallow in a pity party about what is going on in our lives. Right. She, over through the years, decided that I'm going to live. And she had to make that decision for herself. No one could make it for her. So help me welcome to the Jocelyn Drake Show, Dr. Deborah Winans. Woo! Hello, everybody. We're so sorry. <laughs> that is okay. Um, we think all things is done in time. And so we want to welcome you. Thank you for taking the time out and to continue to persist to make sure that we have the conversation. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I am Deborah Winans, and I have two amazing uh, grown adult children. But um, I am an entrepreneur and an author, excuse me, and I believe in empowering men and women to be their absolute best through your crisis and through your trauma that God has a plan. He has a plan for your life and he uses all of it to make us the people we are today and what we will become. You said something so powerful that through the trauma and through the crisis. Yes. Um, I, I, I had a show a couple of weeks ago and we talk, talked about the importance of understanding there is purpose in the midst of the trauma. And yes, ma'am. Go through. If we can just get to that other side. And so you, before we had technical difficulties, begin to talk to us about becoming whole. Um, mm -hmm. It was a journey of putting all those broken pieces uh, back together and becoming whole. So first, give us a backdrop of how the book and pieces came to be. Uh, well, I've always been a writer. I've always journaled. Journaling was my way of working through. I would write and disclose a book and never go back and read it. It was my form of release. Uh, of course, I was married to a well-known um, artist uh, that was known around the world. And so being thrust into that environment was very difficult and very challenging for me. But I had, our marriage was not good. And we were uh, going through a legal separation that ended up in an unwanted divorce. So the trauma of all that, the anger, the bitterness, the, you know, my whole life was altered. My children and I, our whole life was altered. And so one day um, I was walking around the house and I just felt this prompt to write. I went and got my computer and I started writing everything I was feeling, everything I was seeing, where I had all of these questions. What in the world am I gonna do now? I've always had my own thing, but I am a wife. I am a person who wants to be married and wants to be in a relationship. So I was trying to figure out, being a single mom is never something I wanted to be. So I was trying to figure all this stuff out. I had buku questions. I bet you God was like, what do you want now, little girl? <laughs> I had so many questions. So a friend of mine took me, uh, asked me to come with them to California. I sat in the, in the hotel room by myself and I said, I have some questions to ask you. And after throwing my Bible up in the air and waiting for the scripture to jump out at me and it just nothing ever jumped, then I closed it. And I said, God, I need to know these things. And the three questions that I asked him was number one, what difference does it make? Who files for the divorce if the covenant is already broken? Number two, why do I keep praying? for you to change the heart of someone who doesn't want their heart changed. And number three, what does it say about me that I am begging you to make a man love me? And that's when my journey began. 
Now hold up a minute. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, let me make sure my light is good over here. You said you what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what did it say about me? What does it say about me? That. I love that because what does that say? We got to take responsibility. We and have to. We have to take, and that's what my whole journey was about, Jocelyn, was taking responsibility for my thought life, my behavior, my actions, and my belief system. What was it that I truly believed? Because everything was in question for me. I serve God. I love God. Mm -hmm. I have lived for him for my whole life, and my life was not going according to plan. What, what's happening here? People told me if you do A, B, C, and D, God will do E, F, and G. So I believed it. I drank all the Kool-Aid only to find out his journey was very different for me. Only to discover, he said, if you do it my way, do this, go through this process, which is something we do not like. Go through this process and it will change your life forever. And honestly, that was all I had was his word. Mm. That was it. There was no, because nothing else was working. And as I started on this journey is when he started showing me things and it had nothing to do with my ex. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was all about Deborah mm. and what, Deborah, what God had called Deborah to do and the lineage that Deborah came from and where I was going. It was all about me, how to raise my children, how to navigate through these different places of my, these new seasons of my life. How do I navigate through all of that? Where do I, where do I even begin? Mm -hmm. So my journey began with a whole lot of questions. I love that. Like, you know, we talked earlier about the book that I've written and what it basically does is it maybe gives you a paragraph, but then you have to ask yourself the questions. I believe that question, the, the wrong question will keep you in the wrong place. It will keep you in the past, but the right question will keep you propel. It will propel you forward. So I totally believe that what you said, that's what helped you start and move forward in your journey was mm -hmm. asking the right questions. Like asking God, why me? It's not the right question. Right. Stay right there. Keep asking, why me? Why me? Okay, mm -hmm. God, what am I to learn out of this? What are you trying to teach me? What is the purpose out of that? Now that propels you forward. Yes. And I love, I, you know, you said a grown woman thing right there. When you said, <laughs> what does it say about me? Like I'm still stuck on that. <laughs> yeah, because I, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out. I thought I was attractive. I thought I, I was wife material. I was a good mom. So I couldn't figure out, well, what's wrong? The first thing we do, what's wrong with me? Who told us something was wrong with us? Why do we believe we had to be a 24, 36, 24? Why do we think we had to be a size four? Why do we think we have to be beat? Our face have to be beaten. We look at all the time. We have to be on all the time. Who told us that was what was ex the expectation of us as a woman? It's a lie. And that was hard for me to swallow that I had this image in my mind. I had this, I was this person's wife. I was in this family. I came from that family. So surely, you know, what's wrong? There was a whole lot wrong because we, we're taught Unfortunately, we were taught you are not whole until you have a husband. Mm. Well, you, yeah, you're not whole. He completes you. All of this stuff. And when I re remember driving down I-65, I remember like it was yesterday. And the Lord spoke to me and said, he said, you did not marry into purpose. I created you with purpose. And it took me weeks, probably months, to let that sink in. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, what does that mean? That I didn't marry the purpose. 
because it dispels the lie that you were, um, he completes you or you're not whole without. That's not true. I have to be a whole person married to a whole person Absolutely. or dating a whole person or being a whole person in a friendship or being a whole person in business. I, as the individual woman, have to be whole. And that the purpose that God created for me, it never altered. It He never changed his mind about me or you or whoever is listening. He never changed. He's not like people. He is emphatic. His word will not return unto him void. So our job is to find out what that word is. But there's also things that come with receiving that word, discovering that word, that means we gotta go on a journey. That means we gotta roll our sleeves up and do some work because we we can be a hot mess. Let's just face it, a hot, 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 hot mess. Absolutely. I love to say that when I read the word of God and I see that mirror, I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm a hot mess. Hot, <laughs> hot, hot mess. <laughs> Help your child because I'm a hot mess. Amen. Mm -hmm. I love what you were talking about, dispelling the myths of um, women or you are somebody when you once you get married and mm -hmm. you're not somebody until you get married. And so we have all these single ladies waiting for someone to come along and give them value. And um, it's such a lie. You know, in the beginning, God created man and woman and he told them to have dominion. He told each one of them. He gave each one of them the authority. He just didn't keep it. He just didn't say man have authority. He said man and woman have authority. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we walk around when we live in the myth of the lie. And unfortunately, it's taught in the church. Um, you know, it's such a, it's, it's, it's sad. Um the things sometimes that we're taught through tradition, just handed down traditionally um, that keep women oppressed. And we wonder why we don't have dominion. Now we have success, success, mm -hmm. you accomplish your goals and mm -hmm. everything, but dominion gives you authority. It gives you power. Mm -hmm. We don't have that power to change because we're trying to dominate each other. <laughs> and see, and, and that's real because, and people, um, especially women, we have a, a, a tendency to, we think we have something to prove. And it is sometimes um, easier to look down on a sister or be critical of our sister that is doing well, or one who is trying to come up to do better. Well, the truth is we, real women, real, R-E-A-L, real women compete, complete, not compete. If I am not, if I, if my job as a woman, if you have just something you're doing, Jocelyn, and I can help you, it's my responsibility as your sister in Christ, as a black woman to black woman to help you succeed. If we're not doing that, then what in the world are we doing? What are we doing? And those are things that God is after. I don't need you to, I don't need somebody to crit be critical of me. I do want, um, I want um, constructive criticism that will help me to grow, but not to squash me, not to make me feel bad about myself, not to make me feel like I can't do something. We've got this thing all backwards. It's all wrong. And we're responsible. We have to be held accountable for that. I had some people say some crazy things to me in this process. And I would like, did that just come out your mouth? <laughs> Are you serious? Wow. So during the process, did you discover who your real friends were or were you, sh or did you have real friends or were you shocked? Girl, let me tell you, <laughs> I wrote a whole chapter about it in my book, which my book is available on Amazon.com and it's also available on my website, DebraDWinens.com. I'm gonna put that in the. Um, I had friends, but I had, I didn't have as many as I thought I did, because when my life altered, they left. Mm -hmm. When I couldn't go shopping, they my, the phone calls to invite me to ceased. 
um, I wasn't a part of that upper echelon anymore. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, we just didn't want you to feel uncomfortable, but I walked with you through hell. Did you forget that? So I had to learn a lot of things about um, real covenant relationships, what that means. Mm -hmm. So I learned that people are in your, your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. What is that person adding to my life? If they are subtracting from my life, it's not going to work. What are you adding to my life? Will you celebrate me as I celebrate you? If you're not doing those things, if, if I can't be open and just naked before you say, Jocelyn, I am struggling today. This is the area that I'm struggling in. And if you if you can may not be able to do anything to fix it, but you can be there. So I learned who my friends were, and my circle was very and still is very very small. And I'm so okay with it. I think that's very good. Um, a lot of times when God is separating you from the pack, and He has a purpose that's not necessarily aligned with where you're going. You will have what's called that ex as Isaiah. And for people who don't know, um, I have a lot of people that look at this show. I'm talking about a prophet named Isaiah in the Bible. He had an experience that uh, someone that he had great favor with, he was the king. And so the king had all this authority and power. And, you know, everybody was probably trying to connect to Isaiah. But he said, but in the king that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Hi. Sometimes uh, we need that separation in order to see the Lord, because in those seasons, God is saying, like, I, something is coming. There's more for you. There's more I need you to do. And you need to hear me. You need to lock in to me. Mm -hmm. And so it does the act of separation. And it, boy, does it hurt. <laughs> it does hurt. And, there, and this is the thing. Everybody can't go with you in the seasons that you're going in. That was the hard understanding for me. I was like, because my nature is, oh, I want to take, she can go with me and she can go with me. And ooh, oh my God, this would be a great opportunity for her. And oh my God, this is so, you know, and God was like, no. And that was so hard mm -hmm. because where I was going was going to require something different of me. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it's, this is, this is so amazing. And I, I, my next book, which I'm working on my next book, but in this book, life altered, not over. I talk, I have a whole chapter about friendship and I learned this in first King when Solomon was gathering his administration, he named all these different positions, the guard of the house, the administrator, he did all these different titles. Then he gave this one, Zadok, friend, an advisor to the king. I was like, wow. The friendship was so important to Solomon. He made it an office. Mm -hmm. That's good. Jesus, he had the 12, then he had the 72, then he had the 12, but he had those three. And friends that will lay their life down for you is, is not friend, you saying you're my friend, those words, choose them wisely mm -hmm. because your friendships will be tested. Mm -hmm. And if they're from God, they will stand. Yeah, there are seasons in our life where everything will be tested. Absolutely. <laughs> there will be a shaking uh, there when purpose is calling. There's going to be a, a, a earthquake that's going to go on. And the only thing that's going to be remain is what God allows. What is for you in this season? What Absolutely. is necessary? Whether it's covenant, unfortunately. Um, I, God says, I hate divorce. And we know that. We know that. Um, how do we explain that away? We can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But th this is the thing, though, where, where I think, and I had somebody to ask me many questions about it. And I said, you know, you have to kind of look at things for what they really are. And God always says to me, my people don't want to walk in reality. But you have to look at things. You know, and, and quit trying to spiritualize everything and look at some practical applications that are spiritual. So you look at just because uh, you are saved, love God, and you marry a person that loves God and say, saved, love God, does not mean you're compatible. Doesn't. 
that's a very important key that they love God. They have a prayer life. They're, but so is being a communicator, a provider, person that cares for you. All of that is important. So it's not enough just to say, oh, I want him because he saved, he's speaking tongue, he loved Jesus. No, <laughs> because you can be all of that and not know how to be a good husband, not know how to be a good wife. So that's why wholeness is so vital that you're whole in your mind, in your will, and in your emotions, that you're not an emotional wreck, that you fall apart and everything that comes down, that you have strength and wisdom, that when the storm does come, you can hear from the Lord, you get on your face and get instructions on what to do, what not to do, how to move, when to be still. God will give us those instructions when we're still enough to hear his voice. And that's not just in marriage, that's in relationships, that's in business, that's in ministry, that's in family, that affects every area of our life. So as we're becoming whole, we can't be that without God. We can't even get the direction of what to deal with first without his instructions. You, you know, we say that sometimes and I think about, um, um, I think about what covenant is supposed to be. When God told man and woman to come together um, and to come in a covenant where it would be for life. I think um, we were supposed to be whole to a certain degree, but I think what covenant was meant to do that even with the good and the bad, and that's something that we don't uh, necessarily want to go through. I find in, in relationships, like you're not, it's not going to always be good and it's not always going to be bad, but you and I stood and made a covenant, whether um, it, it just irregardless, sometimes covenant means to my own hurt. And so we're so easily to quick to break covenant because we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. That means that that young girl that you married at age 25, she's going to grow. And through that growing, there's some things that are going to happen. And that young man that you married at age 25, um, he's going to grow and some things are going to change. He's going to go through midlife crisis and she's going to go through this and you all are mm -hmm. going to have challenges. But the covenant that you made. Um, when these different individuals are evolving because you're going through life processes and journeys, um, you made a covenant that I'm going to stick with you even when I don't like you, even when this is happening, even when that is. And we made a pact that you and I are going to stay together. And I think that we don't know um, before we get married, don't we don't realize like the cost in it. I was reading uh, the chapter where the Jews, they came and asked Jesus, um, um, is it such a thing as divorce? Is it okay for us to have divorce? And the Lord told them, he said, you know, in the beginning, it was not so, but Moses allowed you to do so because of the hardening of your hearts. He um, said, yeah, but he said, now I say to you, anyone who marries a wife and divorces her outside of sexual immorality commits adultery. Now that's his word. And the disciples came back and said, wow. Uh, we should not get married. And Jesus said to them, uh, this is a hard word. Not everyone is able to endure it. Eunuchs, and he began to talk about men that were castrated. So in essence, what he was saying was, listen, you're going to either be divorced, I mean, either not marry and be a eunuch or get married. And I think the reason why the Lord talked about being a eunuch is because of he knows the uh, the testosterone that goes into a man, and it's hard to be um, single and still uh, you know honor God with your body. Uh, the people that do they that are castrated <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in order to walk the walk that they've been called to. If you're going to do it according to His way, and so when we get married, I, I don't think we really count the cost of that thing. Like you know, well you know, I think I've, I've learned so much. Since, since the divorce, I've learned so much. My understanding and my view of marriage is very, very different. And I have, and, and I think it's an individual, um, it, everybody's situation is different. I do not recommend, you have somebody that's, that's physically abusing you, you have somebody that's mentally, emotionally be, abusing you to stay in that situation. It's just not wisdom. But this is what I learned for me. This is just for me. I learned that 
not only did I understand that there were some things that I needed and because of my makeup and how what I desired in a spouse. We sometimes as single women have a very bad habit of ignoring the signs. Mm -hmm. There are some things that we see that are crystal clear. And because of our nature to nurture, we think we can pray that thing away or we can work with them, you know, and we can be there. That is such a big mistake. So you have to ignore, you have to take ownership of the signs that you ignored that said, maybe this is not the person for you. Or number two, maybe you need to wait. Or number three, maybe you need to, they need to prove themselves a little more because this is a thing. Ultimately, the enemy is after your purpose. He's after the reason you were created in the first place. So in doing so, the enemy can bring things that affected you at five or happened to you at five years old and is still messing with you at 50 because you never dealt with it. And so you get married, you do all these things and and you instead of you stopping and saying, wait a minute. Where, where am I? What, what is going on here? So one of the things that I learned is you cannot ignore the signs. And number two, what did God call you do to do together? What did he call you? Yes, there's things that you do individually, but what is the purpose of your marriage? If you don't understand the purpose of your marriage, you have no business marrying that person. Because it all it does is inflate what is already there that is not healthy. So when I look back, I have a different understanding. There are things that I see differently at 40 that there are qualities that I want that are different to me at 50. I There's things that where I am in my life, I am an empty nester. My children are grown, okay? I love to travel. I love to do all kinds. I don't want to marry somebody that that's just wants to stay at home as a couch potato. Does he love God? Absolutely. That's a prerequisite. He has to. But he has to do more than love God. He has to be willing and to know what it is to be a covering for our household that knows how to go as a priest of our home to cover me, my children, his children, if he has them, whatever the case, or to get directions from the Lord from our household. Those things are not in place. Then sometimes divorce is inevitable. But Jocelyn, this is the deal. I got a message from someone that is getting divorced after 33 years of marriage. My heart broke. Because I thought it didn't happen just because they're getting married. This is something that happened 33 years ago. This is something that these are issues that occurred that were not dealt with many years before the divorce came. And that's my point. If you're going to marry or, you're, or you are married, you have to deal with issues as they come. And you have to deal with them in truth. So um, we have uh, Dr. Deborah Wines. If you have any questions for her, please put them in the comment section. And what she's sharing with us is uh, a book that she's written, Altered, uh, My Life Altered But Not Over. And she's talking about uh, sharing with us, uh, she went through a traumatic divorce, divorce that really caused her to look at herself. Um, when you're talking about that, it reminds me of something that, <clears throat> some wisdom about teaching young women how to love their families, how to love their husbands, but it also says to teach young men to do the same. So do you think that there's a breakdown um, that if you maybe had someone before you uh, got married to say, um, you know, Deborah, these are the things that you want to look in uh, for a quality of a man that's going to cover you years down the road. Do you think that uh, we, when we even go, do they, do we even, do we just think about the wedding or do we think about maybe a couple of years with, you know, children? Do we look, do we honestly go into these marriages thinking about a forever? Do we have a plan of what forever looks like us? Like, do we have conversations about, you know, when we get 20 or when we get 30, this is what we're thinking about. When we get 40, um, this is how I see myself. How do you see yourself? When we get 50, I mean, do we ever look when we go down the aisle or before we go down the aisle to say, this is somebody that I'm coveting with, co co making a covenant with, mm -hmm. that I'm 
with them for the rest of my life. And what does that look like to me? And what does that look like to you? Do you think we ever have those conversations? I think we don't have the conversations enough. And I don't think we have them in great depth. Um, I have those conversations strongly <laughs> with my kids, especially my son mm -hmm. uh, being a man who didn't grow up with his father in the home. Mm -hmm. You understand? Who they didn't see. They didn't, they weren't modeled a healthy marriage. So I, I really try to pour into them as best as I can and to answer some of their questions. And then I challenge them about who they are and how they deal with things and how they see and where did that come from? Where did that develop? So I don't think we do it enough, Jocelyn. I think we, we yeah, we want this beautiful wedding and all of that, but I talked to my daughter about her value as a woman and who she is. The more I talk to her, she doesn't just choose just anybody because she understands what her expectations are. Why? Because I put it in her. I talk, I talk to her about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And my son, he's a boy, he, he's a man, he thinks different. You know, boys and girls are completely different. So his approach to things is very different, but he's the thinker. He's the thinker. My daughter is the analytical one. He's the he's the one that's more cautious. So his thing is, I had to change the way I talked to him the older that he got. I'm the first woman he ever loved. So I had I'm setting this precedence of the kind of woman he will look for. So I couldn't talk to him the same way as a seven that I did at 17. I had to change the way I approached him as he was coming into his manhood. I know because I'm doing that, it will change things for them. It's a game changer for them in their dating and when they get married. However, there's stuff they're going to go through that we can't save them from. It just is. But I believe that if we equipped our children with knowledge and wisdom, they can make better choices. Now, I came from five brothers who were all married, longevity in marriages, 20 plus years or more. So I couldn't figure out what in the world happened to me. I figured it out. I, there were a lot of things that I was still broken. There were a lot of things that he was broken. So bringing two broken pieces together does not make you whole. So I think I had to you have to, or all of us, I admonish you, even if you're dating somebody, have those hard conversations about where are we going and what if this happens and hypothetical and, you know, can I trust you with my heart? Can I, can I trust you? Will you protect me? Will you honor me? We don't have those kind of conversations. Now I do now. Because, you know, I am dating, but I just, I needed to know from what I had experienced, what I lacked. I wanted to know, can this thing work together or not? And if it doesn't work, you walk away and say, thank you, Jesus, for letting me know ahead of time. So what you, what in essence, what you've learned is something I think is extremely powerful in teaching young women what to look for on their journey um, before they get into these relationships. Um, hindsight is twenty twenty sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we we can sometimes we learn, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't. <laughs> sometimes we go right back into the same. Yes, we do. And a lot of times what we don't understand is we attract who we are. Unfortunately, as you mm -hmm. said, I had to ask myself, what it does it say about me? Mm -hmm. that I'm begging a man to love me. What is I'm, I'm praying to God to make a man love me. Mm -hmm. What does it say about me? So when did can you kind of tell us, like, when did the breakdown in your marriage start? Was it something from the beginning? Did it happen maybe later on um, in a couple of years that you start saying, that it was a breakdown. Did you go to counseling? Did you get advice? Did you, you know, how did, did your parents know, or was it something that you just kept to yourself, or did you have uh, girlfriends that you had confidence in? Did he uh, have people that he could um, ask questions? Or first of all, did you all even care enough about the marriage to even take it that place? 
Uh, I cared very much about my marriage. Um, I was in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw things in the beginning. And I once we came back from our honeymoon, they went straight into the studio. So the music business took off like a rocket. And I was like, good Lord, the success happened so fast that I couldn't get my bearings. I, I functioned because that's, we can wear multiple hats, but the marriage, the, the, the career was up here and the marriage was down here. So the marriage was not a priority. And yes, I went to counseling. I think he went once or twice, but I went because I was trying to understand that is my nature. So I, I wanted, I wanted to know where was I missing it? What was really going on here? But I, it, I soon realized that this was not, this, this could go a whole nother way. This could go another way. Excuse me, because it takes two people. You, what I, what I will say that when you're in counseling, People really need to be honest when they're in counseling because, and you need to be honest because I wasn't, I wasn't clear. I wasn't fully honest in counseling because I didn't know if that information was out, how I was going to, what the backlash could be. That's just what I was thinking. Um, how, how was this going to, Oh, it's like, if I say that, then you're going to say that. And if I say that, oh, no, that's okay. Just forget it. So it's, it's a big mistake. It's a big mistake. But I went, I kept going because I wanted me, I wanted me to be fixed. And when I knew the marriage was going to be dissolved, I continued with me and my children. So that the, in the next, because I was determined that I wanted to be healthy. I wanted to be healthy. I did not want to be a woman scorned. I did not want to be this angry black woman and dog this black. I was not. I refused to do that, which is why the tagline in my book says my silent journey to wholeness. I came off the road. I gathered me and my kids and we went and got some help. So I think for me, it just, it, it probably wasn't the best choice in the first place. It was a decision that I made. I cannot say that God opened up the windows of heaven and said, this is your husband. I cannot say that. Um, but what I can say that the decision that we made to be married, um, God bless us with two amazing children. And I am for ever grateful to God for that. They were my, my assignment was to raise them in the fear of God. And so I just think you have to be so transparent and honest with yourself about what you think marriage is and what it is not. And love, I'm sorry. I love what you were talking about, which I think is huge. Um, when you were having the counseling sessions, how you um, were afraid to really be honest because mm -hmm. we think covering we take covering as cover up. <laughs> we cover up things and it didn't happen. And, oh, I can't tell anybody rather mm -hmm. than covers, which means mm -hmm. that we're going through the process. I'm not going to go out there and tell people what's happening, but we're going to deal with it. We're going to walk through it. We're going to get the needed help. But I, what I find is a lot of times because we don't want to go through the shame. We don't want the backlash. We don't want all of that. We don't want we go and cover things up. We hide things. So people don't even know that we're going through a lot of times. <laughs> Oh yeah. And we were taught that we were taught cover your husband. You know, you got to you shut your mouth and stay on your knees. Mm. Wow. Okay. Sometimes mm. we do need to shut our mouth. We need to always stay on our knees, but there's also a practical, practical side called communication. You have to have the conversations. Do you feel that it's important? Okay. Because of what you said, <clears throat> you were, you were instructed to, Shut your mouth and stay on your knees. 
Um, is that not a part of cover up, though? Is that it is? Don't you think that instead of that being the advice that we see how we can get him help? I'm telling you, these are things that's going on um, that's concerning me and he needs help. And oftentimes, we, you know, it's kind of like the Eli syndrome. I, sometimes I even wonder um, in the church realm or, you know, in leadership and different things. Do we even know what people are going through or, if their integrity or their morality, if they need help, or do we even care? We just want them to do what we, you know, sing, preach, um, usher, whatever. I'm just talking about church and same with the job. Of course, we know the job didn't care one way or the other what happens to us. But uh, because you, you're coming out of the church realm, do you think that we just absolutely don't care about people? We love the gifts. Um, that's all we want to know about is the gifts. We don't have time to fool with all your personal stuff right, right here because uh, we just want you to, to preach this thing, you right, know, right. You to get up here and usher and, and lead us into mm -hmm. you know, the presence of the Lord. I don't care that your husband's beating you. I don't care that your children is blah, blah, blah. I don't care that you don't have money to buy uh, mm -hmm. groceries. No, just get up here, do what we need you to do mm -hmm. and, and go you know about your business and if you have issues we shine you and we leak your business and you know we talk up behind you behind your you know your back mm -hmm. so um the cover up is huge and you see you see it I, I heard you on an interview and you talked about how the ladies just silently give each other this look and you know um that yeah mm -hmm. uh, she going she's going through as mm -hmm. well it's a huge cover up we never get healed we never get whole mm -hmm. so, and we know from what you just said, not to say a word because nobody cares for real. I just need to shut up. So we live in what you call silence. Mm -hmm. Go through the silence and the silent frustration like nobody cares about mm -hmm. me because we do want to cover our, our husband, but we know he needs help. We're not here to cover up his mess. Right. <laughs> Pastor, please help him <laughs> some kind of way. Or can you mom or <clears throat> daddy or uh, somebody uh, help, our, help your child? Well, you know, it, it, some this is what I, I have experienced personally, and I can only go by what I've experienced personally and what other people have told me. But sometimes people just don't want to get involved. Right. Okay. It's not my business, yes. It's not my business. But yet you, you're you my covering. You're my pastor. You're my bishop. You're my, you don't want to get involved. I, I hadn't figured that one out yet. There is a lack of accountability. And so... If you're not accountable, you don't want to expose, which is, you're not trying to expose in the sense of bringing harm. You're wanting to have, and it's not exposed in front of the world. It is in a private session with the person, with the ministry I pay tithes to, uh, some pastor that I'm submitted under. But this is the deal. Not every pastor is a good counselor. That's not their gifting. Right. It's not. And I think every church in the world needs to have an out to resource an out outsource a resource that can help people because that's their profession. Whether it's they're a believer or not. I think the other thing is they don't. People don't want to get their hands dirty. They don't want to be messy and they our focus on what, like you said, what that person's ability is. I think that one of the things that's been most frustrating to me is when people, all they see is the gift. All they see is the anointing. All they see is that. And sometimes it's not the anointing. Sometimes it's just a gift. People are just gifted. Doesn't mean they're anointed. They're gifted in their craft. They are good at what they do. God give them the gifts. But nobody's asking about their character. And you know this wife or husband, because we have some women out there, mm -hmm. is in trouble. And instead of you saying, look, I don't, I don't know all the details, but how can I help you? What can I do? And they may, that person may say, I'm not really willing to talk to you. You say, well, let's go find somebody who you can talk to. That's caring about me, not just taking my money. And not just using my gift, not just prostituting me. Because that's what we're doing, prostituting your gift. But somebody that actually cares about Deborah. 
And that's what that person who was a clinical psychologist and a pastor, when she called me that day, and we're very good friends, she could care less what my last name was. She could care less who I was married to. She was concerned about me because she did not want me to have a mental break. And I was definitely on the verge. This is what I do understand. Those people are far few and in between and they're rare. So when God sends somebody, you take hold of it and you, you accept that this is a gift from him that's going to help you walk from point A to point B. And you have to forgive the people who were not there for you. You have to forgive the people who you felt used you and your spouse. You have to forgive them because they are where they are. So to carry the bitterness and the anger of that, it affects you. It's like you drinking poison, expecting for them to die. Forgive them, release them, and move forward and ask God for the grace and the wisdom to help you heal. Yeah. Um, we are talking to Dr. Deborah Wines, and um, I just pulled up her book. I'm, I'm pull it up again. I don't know what happened. It, name off, but let me get it up again. You can get her book on Amazon. I placed the link in the uh, comment section where you can go to either to her website and get the book. She's sharing with us um, her journey to wholeness and how she did it in silence. There was a such a, a different type of disposition. She didn't go around telling people her business and, you know, this, that, and the other, trying to ransack and mess up the reputation of the person that she had um, um, gotten a divorce with. She handled it with integrity. And um, out of it came a book. Uh, and so she's here sharing with us about the book. So if anyone is going through laws, having issues in relationships, divorces or, or whatever it may be, um, this is her book um, there, Life Altered Not Over Again. You can find it on Amazon. Um, it talks about my, soul, my silent journey to wholeness. Um, and or you can go to uh, DeborahDWinans.com and get the book. It is extremely powerful. Or you can cash at me at dollar sign Deborah Winans, D E B R A W I N A N S, and the book is $12. And if you cash at me, please put your mailing address in the memo of the cash app. I'm putting that in the comment section. Okay. Um, also, if you have any questions for her, you can uh, feel free to do so. so you were talking, um, you know, it's just such a, a, a broad subject with so many emotions and really mm -hmm. to know uh, to help other people navigate this uh, thing, you know, better in a better way. Um, and, and not even that, uh, Dr. Wine, is to help people even before they uh, get into it. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we have conversations you're doing with your child as I do with mm -hmm. my about uh, what you're looking for before you get to get into this marriage because you want to go in with a with the life uh lifetime in mind and you want the person to have the same type of mentality right. sometimes right. you can uh connect with people who don't have that they can see you there um i can take or leave or you know it's just depending on what happens I should or make... divorce is an option yeah absolutely absolutely and, and i said this next time go around divorce is not an option for me Mm -hmm. It is not an option. Mm -hmm. But but again, I think, Jocelyn, you're so right. We have to prepare people. And then we have to help prepare people when, they, when they're coming out of a situation. Mm -hmm. Because you, there are a plethora of emotions. I don't wish divorce on my enemy. Mm -hmm. I, it is a very, very brutal situation. Even if you came out of it amicable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the 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 alteration of your life and learning the new cycle of your life and getting an understanding of what happens next and to know your place and your purpose and how do I navigate through these processes? And even sometimes things come up years after you've gone through a divorce and you're like, where did that come from? Because God knows us. He knows when it's time to deal with certain issues. 
But we always have to be in a frame of mind that God, I belong to you. I'm yours. I am your daughter and I am hurting and I am devastated right now. I don't even know if I believe in you right now. I'm so, I'm so done. I'm just done. I, I love that I love that transparency um, because, you know, sometimes we're afraid to say certain things to God. And this is people of faith. And it, well, absolutely. Everybody should have somebody that they um, think is a higher power, I guess. Um, but to be able to be transparent saying, I'm a, you know, I, this right, this thing right here. <laughs> yeah. This, you, is, this is too much. Yeah. Too much. yeah, yeah. When I was, I remember uh, laying in the bed with my kids, but they were taking a nap and they were laying in the bed with me and I had them very close to me. And I honestly prayed this prayer. I said, God, when we wake up, let us be with you in glory. It's too painful right now. And I don't want to leave my babies. So just take us all home. Just take us home with you. And when I woke up and I was still here, I was so angry. I said, did you hear what I said? What are you doing? Why would you make me face this? This is this is how I was talking to God. He didn't fall off his throne. He didn't none of that. He's not moved by that because he knows me. And I just couldn't understand why he didn't change things. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. He will turn it whichever way he chooses. He wasn't turning anybody's heart but mine. Mm. I thought that was so unfair. <laughs> what do you mean? Why? He said, because I need you to focus on where I'm taking you. I need you to heal because you got to do this and you got to go there and you got to touch this one. And you and I was like, I know, but it hurts. I tell people all the time, going through this process was like having open heart surgery with no anesthesia. You feel everything, every piece of it. So what I didn't understand is that later I will be able to help a woman who was right where I had been. What I didn't understand, a man would come along and say, this is where I am. Where do I go next? I didn't see it. I couldn't see it because it was too painful. And for those who are more spiritual than I am, who just felt like, you know, well, go, the Lord is good and it's just going to be okay. That was not Deborah. Deborah was having a hissy fit. <laughs> I was hot as fish grease. This is hurt. It's not fair. He said, trust me. There's times that God is so quiet. that He's not saying nothing. And you have to trust him when you can't trace him. You have to trust him. Choose to trust him when you cannot trace him. You don't know what in the world he's doing because he's too wise to make mistakes. He doesn't, it's not in his DNA. It's not who he is. So if I understand that he's my father, if I understand that he will never leave me nor forsake me, if I understand that I am the righteousness of God, I am a royal priesthood, okay. Then God, with, with tears running down my face, Okay, let's take let's take one day at a time with this thing. Sometimes it felt like second by second. Then it was minute by minute. Then it became days by days. Then I got in a in a posture where trusting him was as natural as breathing. Because I knew he had me and he has all of us, if you trust him, with your we we can do stuff for the in the kingdom of God. We're a- active in the church all day long. Yeah. But do we trust him with our very heart? Yeah, I think that's the point. We uh, trust man real easily with our hearts, but we don't trust God. And how can we give a man our heart that we have never given our father our hearts? Um, and so, you know, I think uh, that's a whole nother subject. I want to. That's talk- a whole nother subject. <laughs> Um, I want to take the time to um, share with you, Dr. Uh, Winans will be with us at our Queendom Conference. Um, that's a free virtual summit uh, that will happen July 15th. In fact, next Friday through Saturday, Saturday she will be speaking Saturday. 
um, at 7 p.m. And so we invite you all. It's a free conference again. <laughs> um, all you have to do is register. We have some uh, powerful women from around the world. They're in Sydney, Australia, Russia. They're all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to talk about business and leadership. We're going to talk about mental and self-help, uh, self-care, as well as um, our our taking care of our bodies. So we got all of that going on because we love women at Queendom. <laughs> I placed the link in the uh, in the uh, comment section. You can just click on there and get registered. We would love to see you and hear these powerful speakers as they help you to transform your life and um, to really think about uh, what what is the next look like for me and get you started on that path. And I'm super excited to have you. Uh, yes, I'm excited. It's going to be awesome. Uh, so getting back to our interview, <laughs> it has been uh, really, really good. What I what I wanted to kind of get a little bit more clarity on is like, so how did it happen? Was it something that you knew was going to happen? Did it take you by surprise? And when it happened, what were what what happened after that? Where were you? I mean, kind of help us give us give us okay. details. Um, not necessarily him himself, because that's not important. This is your story, but from mm -hmm. your from how, how how did that go down for you? Um, I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I was in the floor playing with my son and I received a phone call that informed me that he had filed for legal separation and I had no idea. But I had a person living in my home who did. So in my book, I talk about betrayal and all of that stuff. This is so, a family member or rep? Uh, uh, no, they were living. They were living. They were helping you all. Yeah, living there. Just they were living them. with us. Yeah, to help with the children and all that. Right. And yeah. Um, and so it, you never knew that. Oh, um, you were just y'all were going. For, I mean, what was he talking to you, or you, or was he on the road that you didn't? He was. It, he was on a flight, and I. <laughs> he was on a flight. He was on his way somewhere. He actually called, and um, I was calm and he said what, what oh, he's like stuttering right and i said that he what, what, where, where you, i said oh we're just i'm just in the floor playing with benjamin myers dancing around it was real calm so he knew that i didn't know yet by my reaction my, my response mm -hmm. and so he hung up <clears throat> he was on his way somewhere he's all just call you guys when i land no problem and then maybe about 30 minutes to an hour maybe later I get this phone call that he had filed for this legal separation. So I had not been served yet. I think he thought I was already served. Mm -hmm. And I think nobody but God did that, intervene for that for me. Um, <clears throat> so I was in shock. Mm -hmm. I was in utter, because there was no conversation mm -hmm. about this decision. There was no, hey, we're not getting along. Let's do something so he different. Never said that. He never said, you know, I'm just done with this. And, you know, when, I am. Normally when a person said they're done with this, you know, it's hard to, hard to hear. You just say, okay. <laughs> and no. then you let it, you know, whatever, take it course, take its course. You right. don't run behind them. Well, some of us do. We run behind them and try to change their minds. But if they say, I'm done with it, and you say, well, okay. And mm -hmm. let's figure out what's the next move. So you never had that type of conversation. Mm -hmm. No, no. And so I then had to figure out how I was going to do this and what, what does all that meant, mean? Because that's not something, divorce was not an option for me. And so I was trying to figure out, and you, in my mind, I've got this, this four month old baby, this three year old daughter, what am I going to say to them? Now they were used to him being in and out because he was always gone, but it's another thing to walk around the house and everything that represented him is gone. From the clothes to the awards to all of that, it's gone. And so having to explain, but I it took a while. It took a, it took a long while. Um, and I had to explain, of course, to my daughter because she was older and to explain to her that daddy was not coming back home again and that he was going to live someplace else and she's always been old an old soul and um just trying to communicate that to her over time 
she started asking questions. And I was like, how do I answer these questions in a child appropriate manner? So I wasn't doing this thing of, you know, your daddy ain't no good. He is low down, dirty dog. I wasn't, we didn't do all of that. Um, so I just asked God for wisdom and explained it in terms where she could understand. So it was going to be the three of us. So we were the three of us and we just worked through it. Um, I was just trying to figure out how we were going to live. Do I need to go get a job? Cause my, he's like, I say he's four months old. I have always worked. So working was not foreign to me. I've always had a job. So I got to figure out, do I do daycare? All this stuff that you do, do I do, do I get daycare? Do I, who keeps my kids? I did that. All of that, trying to figure all of that out. So you weren't in a position where you was just at home taking care of the kids and relying on him. Um, you had a job. And so after that decision, you just kept working so that you could support your family. Your right. Family. And, and I, I didn't, it took me a while to find something that would work with our schedule. Um, Cause I didn't want somebody else raising my kids. This was very difficult. Um, and they're not your average kids. They just they just aren't. And so I've got to figure out, make sure that they're in an environment that people respected our privacy. Um, the schools that they went to, I, you know, all of that was important. So it took it took a while. Um, so then we we were separ legally separated for three years, and then he came and said he wanted it was over, and I was I wasn't shocked. But I was very angry so because legal, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. So legal separation. Um, were you all working on the marriage or you just decided that or well, he decided what was his purpose? Why? I guess I'm trying to figure out why not just divorce first. Or was that something you had to go through in the count, the state that you lived in first separation? then divorce? Uh, no, you could. I, I thought we were supposed to be trying to work on it, but yeah. that really was just time for him to put things in order. Mm -hmm. um, and there was nothing, there was nothing that gave me any hope that this was going to be reconciled. There was no uh, meeting of the minds. There, there was none of that. Um, and I, and I, I think it was by the second year that I realized, okay, he doesn't really want this because he's not doing what we need to do to bring this together. So when he decided he wanted the divorce, it was irreconcilable differences. And I said, what were those differences? And just too much, just, oh, okay. Which his form of communication, that's what it was anyway. So if it was you know, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it. And it just didn't happen. It just didn't happen. But again, it's ignored signs. Again, it takes me back to the beginning. These are things that I saw and I should have dealt with it then, but I didn't. And so I can't be mad at him in all honesty. I can't be mad at him because it's just as much my fault as his. It's just as much my responsibility as his. So I, I had to go and realize, wow, Jocelyn. Hello, hello. Okay, we're back. Okay. <laughs> uh, geez, we're going to get this interview over. We're going to get it together. Um, so you talked about the fact that it was, um, you know, you had to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so this will be a lesson learned to all of us who are single, um, ready mm -hmm. to get married. Really mm -hmm. um, consider. Um, if, if you know that you want someone that communicates, that talks and that can have conversations with you, make sure that you, that's what's happening in your dating stage. Um, don't act like oh, he's, he's not a huge communicator. So, but when we get married, we're going to be talking about stuff. No, no, <laughs> no. no. It's, if, it's, if it's not happening up front, it's probably not going to happen. And you you don't, and so sometimes you can really care about a person and really love a person. And you can say what we do. I love him enough to help him grow. I help him love. No, what we're saying is I love him enough to help him change. 
and you cannot change the heart of anyone. I don't care that you cannot change their heart. And so those things about communication and talking, those things are vital. They are vital. It's like the pieces of a puzzle, you know, communication is one. Um, your your personal likes and dislikes, your own personal belief system, his personal belief system. You have two histories coming under one roof. He come from a whole lot of stuff. I come from a whole lot of stuff. All that comes under one roof. So if you're not talking about things and you're not communicating, why are you so shocked that it's falling apart? I'm just like being honest. Absolutely. Like if he... Um, he's not the type of person that likes to go out and do things. And, you know, it's a it's a struggle to try to get him to go, you know, to down the street or whatever, take a walk with you. I um, mean, it only gets worse with uh, only gets worse. marriage. So just don't do it. If that's important, write your list out, ladies, and decide what it is that you see yourself with your mate. What kind of mate? What do you want to experience in life with this individual? So that when you see it and, and, and put the things that are like non-negotiable. Like, I want to have this. <laughs> he may be halfway doing this, but this I have to have. This I have to have. And so when you see and you're dating him and he doesn't give you the have to haves, don't be mad at him. Um, Just, you know, I just, I just, it's just not going to work. In fact, I tell my daughter, do not tell people what you're looking for in them because they will act like they're that. Exactly. <laughs> Keep that between you, yourself, and you. Exactly. So you get married, you're not looking up saying, oh, my Lord, who in the world I married? <laughs> exactly. You find a lot of women doing that. Men pursue them. They chase them. They they get their all these things. They act like and then when you marry them, you find like, oh, my God, this is uh, Hercules. This is who in the world did I marry? Right. And so, you know, make sure you have your list out. Make sure you know. Don't, as, as Dr. Winans has told us, don't act like you don't see the signs. Mm -hmm. That is who he is. If a person shows you who he is. Believe it. Believe it. Absolutely. And this is, to, and, and when we make our list, I'm not, I'm not talking about the carnal list that says mm -hmm. he needs to make $300,000 a year. He needs to put me in a $5.2 million house. He needs to get, I'm not talking, that's stupidity. I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a man who can provide a man that will protect you with mm -hmm. his life. Mm -hmm. A man that will pray over you. A man that is gentle and kind. Mm -hmm. A man that loves making you happy. That loves surprises. A man that knows how to do something around the house. Besides sitting with his feet crossed waiting for you to come serve him. I'm talking about those practical things that are important. Can I see myself with this person 50 years from now? Is this the only person I'm going to have sex with for the next 20 years? Mm -hmm. I know that sounds crazy, but that's a deal breaker for women that I know. They're like, uh-uh, okay, I need to have variety. Well, okay, whatever. <laughs> and you don't want to be married, okay. But those things are important. A man that, that listens to you, that will hear you, not just he don't he, he like you when your weave is on when your weave is out mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely look like you've gotten your list dr winas because you know what not to do and yes, what ma'am i yes, think her list may be different than yours that may not be yours but make sure you got yours regardless you know right one for me is very important is my voice to have someone in your life that honors your voice, mm -hmm. that act like your voice don't mean anything. <laughs> you know, um, if I'm telling you certain things that you honor that, if I'm asking you for things that you honor that, that you don't act like, oh, get out of my way. I don't right. have time for that. You know, those kinds of things. So you need to know for yourself, ladies, if you're single, take this time and prepare mm -hmm. yourself because this is a covenant for life, supposedly. <laughs> it's supposed to be until death do us part. And love Take yourself out to dinner. Take yourself, date yes. yourself. I know that sounds yes. really, I'm tired of being by myself. I get it. But it's one thing to enjoy being with you. It's another thing that I'm just gone because I ain't got nothing else to do. No, enjoy your life. Go travel. Mm -hmm. um, connect with women your age or in your profession and do all kinds of things. Um, 
go to different restaurants, try different food, become cultural, be very, very, very culture oriented. Just find out. You will be surprised that when you are learning about you, you will discover things that you had no idea that you liked or was important. Absolutely. It's, it is so true. It's like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Or you would love that you want somebody that you love to try adventure. Like I love parasailing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to date somebody or marry somebody who just want to sit on the ground looking at me parasailing. I'm like, no, I'm scared of ice. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> but you learn, you learn different things that you like. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it's like God showing you a you that you hadn't even tapped into yet. Ladies, I am a living witness. It's amazing. It's amazing. And you may not even want to be married. And that is so okay. Okay. Yes, it is. I, it ab is okay. <laughs> I absolutely love that. I teach my daughter. One of the things I taught her in principle, live your life, baby. Live, travel the world. Yes. You have those kids. You're it's like, over. It's a wrap. It's going to be about them. And so it's so important, ladies, take this time and learn who you are. But another thing, make sure you're dating a man who's spending time with himself, too, who likes him. You know, yes. he, ain't all, he, he doesn't always have to be, have, be hooked up with a woman. He actually likes himself. And that's the problem sometimes. We marry men or connect with men who don't like themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't love themselves. They don't spend time with themselves. They go from one relationship to the next relationship. They're always with somebody, afraid to yes. be alone. Afraid to be alone. Yeah, and learn who they are and experience life and know the good, bad, the ugly, and the indifference. Know what I don't want, what I do want. Um, and so if you're doing it, I remember when I was a single woman, I mean, I lived... I knew exactly who I was. Uh, you want to connect with somebody who's lived and know exactly who they are. You don't want somebody that's still trying to figure out and they have all these people in their ears and they're trying to do this to be this way to like for them to like him and that way for this person to like them because they're not sure who they are. And as she talked about, you want a man that keeps you safe, you know, that protect you, um, that'll, that'll guard you regardless. I was sharing with our prayer group about my papa. Um, you know how people will come behind your back and talk about your spouse to you. Um, and well, you know she did this, and, and you know she did that. And people would do that about my mom, and my papa would tell them, but that's my wife. <laughs> come on now. You can say what you want. And yeah, she may have done it, but one thing I want you to know, that is my wife. <laughs> there you go. I may not like what she's doing myself, but still, that is my wife. I'm going to honor her. You're not going to make me dishonor her. You're not going to make me change my mind about who she is to me. No, she's not perfect and neither am I. See, that's the kind of man you want to stand. Come on now. And I'm going to tell you something else, too. You don't want to make, I refuse to let, to make the other person suffer for what I went through in my marriage. Absolutely. That was another reason why I wanted to work through this stuff. Mm -hmm. I was not going to make the new man pay for what my former husband did or did not do or was not. I wasn't going to do that. And so even in my dating relationship, our conversations are, I mean, you still have stuff because this is a new person, right? you got to adjust to this new person. But we talked about our insecurities. Like, oh, I thought I was good right there, but oh, we... Well, let's talk about that, Deborah. Really? You know, it's, you you want to be able to be friends, number one. Absolutely. God, please <laughs> be friends. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that we were not in my marriage. We were not really good friends. Mm -hmm. But you be friends in your relationship. And I love what Dr. Stanley says. Um, Andy Stanley says, are you the person that you're looking for? That's good. Are you, we have all these stipulations, but mm -hmm. are you the person that you're looking for? So I think that when we, whether it's, are you the friend that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. Are you the business partner that you're looking for? It's not just about marriage. Mm -hmm. It's about your wholeness, your whole person and areas that you are going to be connected to with people, 
or with projects or whatever the case may be. Because where you who you are in business, you want to be that same way behind closed door. Who you are in the front of people, you want to be that same person behind closed door. Your integrity. Who are you when nobody's looking? Can I love this person purely and honestly in my girlfriend relationships? Do, do I really have her back as much as she has mine? Do I really? Am I supporting this ministry to the fullest of my ability? Does it matter if my name is called or does it matter? And if it does, why? Those are things that we have to be honest about when that little thing pricks up in you and it comes up, you're like, mm, well, they called so, so they didn't call me. We got to deal with that. Yes. We have to, we're getting older. Our bodies are changing. That's what I'm talking about a whole in my, in my next book. Your body is changing. Your body is going through changes. You are not the same chick you were at 25. Mm -hmm. Not, sorry. <laughs> Love it. Not. Things change. You know, you get them little them lines. So I'm like, where did that come from? You know, and where did that come from? And oh my God, you know. And it's okay. And That's it is thing. okay. It is it is so okay. Listen, yes, we're not trying to be um, these models. It is okay. We want to take care of ourselves and do that well. We don't want to be fake and phony. If it's okay with you, then you will draw people in your life that is okay go. with them as well. Um, Dr. Wines, you have really uh, helped us on today. I thank you so much for uh, you consistently trying to get on with the technology issues that we had. It's been a wonderful conversation. Ladies, uh, uh, ladies, uh, we will have this uh, summit next weekend and uh, please register and hear all the wonderful speakers. And again, she will be speaking on July 17th at 7 p.m. It is a virtual. You can sit right there with your T-shirt on and your house coat and your house shoes. <laughs> the knowledge that these women will be downloading uh, for free. Um, we know it's where we are is basically upon what we know and what we apply. And some things we just don't know. So we're going to go and uh, get all the information we can so that we can go to our next level and personally and professionally be developed yeah. uh, to be the women that we're supposed to be. Thank you. Again. Um, you Thank you. Book. Again, it's in the comment section, dollar sign Deborah Winans, um, $12 and put your mailing address in the memo of the cash app, or you can go to Deborah, Deborah D Winans with an S on the end.com or at Amazon and get her book. Thank you once again. We appreciate Thank you. It. Look to have you back on the job. I am. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. I appreciate you. You're so welcome. Bye-bye, everybody. We'll see you on the next Jocelyn Drake Show. Bye-bye.